Welcome to The Passion Pod with your host, Chris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the feature presentation. Season 5, Episode 3. Welcome back, friends. Today, we are in sunny Los Angeles, hanging out with a prodigy. At least I think he is. Our guest today is an artist in many forms, but perhaps mostly known for his oil painting work. His work with a pencil and his music career certainly are nothing to scoff at either. Welcome to the show. How do you pronounce your last name? Is it Isaac Paleo? Uh, Paleo, Paleo. Either uh, tomato, <laughs> tomato. Yeah, how, 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 whatever tickles your pickle. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So who are you and what are you passionate about? Um, What am I? That's a good question. I don't know what I am. Dumb to apparently a lot of people, <laughs> but um, no, nah, I, I I paint, I do I do music, um, I model, act, uh, do animation at Disney, tattoo, do clothing design, do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. you do a whole bunch of shit. yeah. For, and you're how old are you? Uh, Twenty four. And yeah, okay. So your story's already been talked about quite a bit, and we'll get into it. But you've been doing a lot of art for a long time. But yeah. before we get to that, how like obviously I'm sure you're on every platform. But how can people best follow you and get in contact with you? Um, probably. I mean, Instagram is sort of the like largest driving tool to to get a hold of me. Um, you know, at Isaac Palau, I S A C P E L A Y O. Um, and they can find me same uh, handle via Twitter and Facebook. So. Perfect. So I don't want to spend too much time on stuff that you talked about in other interviews, obviously, because mm. you always want to talk about fresh stuff. But to paint the picture who you are, your childhood wasn't like super, super stable, right? I know you're doing no. stuff with your dad, but can you kind of just summarize? You live, you grew up with your mom and your grandma, right? Yeah, like, I grew up with... the situation? So my parents split when I was born. Um, so obviously, I mean, I went, I grew up with my mom and... Um, it was actually uh, multiple generations. It was my mom, my grandmother, and my great grandmother, and my, my mom's two younger brothers, my, my uncles. So I grew up in that house, and I and I was you know visiting my dad every weekend. So I was back and forth constantly. But my upbringing, like I mean, I felt like I was raised by my mom and my grandmother. Um, so you know, with being in that household, it was there was a lot of turmoil. Um, you know, we grew up on welfare, super you know, um, like stuck in like a very confined place and all of us and people in and out of the house the house was like a hotel um yeah you know it was uh they had just had a lot of battles a lot of people bumped heads you know my mom and dad bumped heads there was everybody in my family had always bumped heads so, so it was like even though that like we are already like financially unstable we were also still like unstable emotionally and and, and mentally so like it was kind of hard to find like some sort of like you know, thing to look forward to because it's like, all right, we're already not financially wealthy. And then, and then we're also like, you know, sort of like got this imbalance in like family orientation and like, you know, sense of emotion and compassion for one another. So it was very hard. So as a kid, I was very like confined, like I was very like, I would isolate myself in, in my bedroom or I mean I didn't have a bedroom up until I was older but like in a bedroom I would I would sit in a corner with a pad and pencil if I had one and I would just draw all day you know it, it was the type of kid that I never got in trouble for anything um I, I would get in trouble because you couldn't find me I was too quiet I was way I was like a mouse you know in the house and um you know, people would be yelling, Isaac, Isaac, where are you? You know, thinking I ran out of the house or something as a kid. And I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm right here. I'm like in the living room in the middle of, you know, the corner of the room, just drawing, minding my own business while every, you know, all the chaos is happening around me. So that, that was pretty much like the sum of like my childhood. You right. Know, so, so, well, okay. So you, and the story has been said a bunch of times that at two, like you did a drawing, your dad has it. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't live with your dad, your dad was always an artist as like a career, right? So where, where did art kind of come in, I guess? And what were you drawing? Were you emulating stuff he did? Was he just picking you up and bringing you places and teaching you how to do some stuff or like how'd that work? Both actually. So like I said, I, I, I went to see my dad every weekend, every other weekend, um, as, as often as I possibly could. So going to my dad's on the weekend, it was always just art. Like every, it was just art. Everything about him was art. You know, I'd go into his house and, and there was art everywhere. Um, we never really sat down and he never really formally taught me how to draw. 
I just saw it around me. And like whenever he was working on work, whenever I was there visiting him, he would trap himself in the room. So I never really got to see my dad work like in person as a kid. That was a very rare like sight Um, because he liked silence. He liked like just being alone, isolated, like no music, nothing, quiet. That's how he works. So, you know, I'd go to his place, see artwork, and he would take me to like art galleries, museums, art shows, auctions. We'd go into like, we'd, you know, be visiting like some of the homie studios. I grew up around like the Seventh Letter Crew. So street art was like a really big uh, instrumental and in influence in my life as a kid, like being even as young as like five, six, you know. I, I was going to go visit like uh, Magoo Studio. Magoo is a, an OG uh, Chicano artist in LA. He's part of like Los uh, Los Four, which is like the first Chicano like super group of like artists in LA. You know, um, that group was like super important. So growing up as a kid, like seven years old, going to like these OGs like studios, it was just like mind blowing. So like my thing was that was what I extracted from visiting my dad and I didn't have anything else to like look forward to or turn to whenever I was going through sh at my mom's, all I, all I ever had was like pencils and, and pads around me. So like, I mean, even, you know, even when I didn't have like, like, like real art tools, you know, I'd use like a, a pencil that I found in the house and like some Xerox paper for my, like my grandmother's printer, which I used to get in trouble for, for like <laughs> taking all the printer paper. But, um, you know, I would just sit there and draw. Like drawing was like my escape. It was like, it was like coming across a drug and like taking your first hit. And, and it's like, you know what I mean? Like, or it's like, like the first time you have an orgasm and like, you're just like, what the f was that? Like, let me, <laughs> let me find that again. So I remember like, as I, as a kid, like I used to draw and like, like hearing the oohs and the ahs from like people looking at me drawing and like seeing my drawings. Like I was drawing a lot as a kid. And, uh, one of the things that really was, um, important and, and a, in, like a, an impact on my life as a kid was, I had a bunch of collections of like, I had a huge collection of like Disney VHS tapes. And like, you know, those really like those VHS tapes that had the huge cover, yeah. you know, like the big yep. cover. So like I had all like the limited edition, like Disney tapes from my dad. So what I would do is like on my free time after school or something, I would draw those covers, you know, like to, to identical as possible. And I used to sell those to like my aunts. And You're talking films. about like the Lion King Fantasia? Yeah, like yeah all Peter Pan, yeah, okay. uh, Aladdin, all those films. I used to draw them like to the T. One of my favorite ones was like Pinocchio. I, I remember drawing Pinocchio so many times and, and Genie from Aladdin. And like I would draw these covers and that was kind of like my introduction to like animation. You know, I was drawing these animations and that was, my dad had always worked at Disney. He, my dad was working at Disney like a couple years before I was even born. So Disney also played a huge role in my life. Like I, I'm what you, I, I guess what you would call me is like a Disney baby. They, they, that's what they call it at work. So I, I was born into it. Like I'd go to my dad's office when I was like six, seven and like everything was Disney. And like, I never went to anywhere else other than Disneyland. All I knew was Disney. And uh, I studied Disney a lot. And like, you know, that was like really influential, even the films itself. Like as I got older, I wanted to become a Disney actor because I was so infatuated with Disney. I, I don't know. There was just something so like appealing to this magical, you know, entity. And, and like, I don't know. It was just, it was one I of the things. I could see how it would resonate with you though, right? Like why, a lot, one of the reasons a lot of people love Disney or why kids love it is it's usually the parental figures aren't the significant thing. It's like the kid in the movie yeah. is like navigating things on their own and being successful and seeing this huge magical world. Which Aladdin, I could see, Peter Pan. Right, that's what I'm saying. I could Lion see where King. that parallel might come from, you know what I mean, with you, with not being with both parents and having a, a stable yeah. household, like kind of seeing that almost, you know? I never never thought about that that way but yeah I, I i think that that that's uh there's a lot of truth to that because um yeah i, I definitely did resonate with the characters in the film i mean i remember like it, it, this isn't a disney film but even like you know uh do you remember land before time yeah totally. as a kid like when, when uh when littlefoot lost his mom you know at one point my mom was kind of in and out of my life as a kid she was just kind of off doing her thing and kind of like i i, I can't really i wouldn't want to put my mom on a spot and like put her on blast but like she was just making mistakes as a as a young mom and like was trying to find herself so like at, for a couple of years i didn't really have my mom uh you know i was just home with my grandmother but like i remember like like yearning for like my parental like you know like nurture like you having you know having my dad in my life every day having my mom in my life every day so like 
Yeah, a lot of those Disney characters they do like don't they, you know they do lose their right. parents. Bambi lost you know Aladdin's like an orphan. Um, Peter Pan like these kids are you know they're orphans and stuff. Right. So yeah, I, I guess I could see the the uh, correlation between that and myself. So that that's interesting. That's an interesting point. I love you. So your artwork like what what I really love, and I guess we'll get more to it in a bit. Your oil paintings, the stuff that I like really resonate with, is so drastically different from what like Disney looks like. So I, and that. And, you rap and do all kinds of stuff so clearly like you you're not in a box at all but the story that so the story that's always like read when you look up stuff about you is that when you were 11 you won this art contest right mm -hmm. i but i haven't really figured out what's the picture of what high school age looked like right because that was sixth grade that was middle school did you graduate high school i mean you said at 15 you were tattooing what happened like what can you explain what was going on actually so with the school i so i grew up as a kid i grew up in riverside and I went to uh, Sierra Vista Elementary, and and Sierra, and el that elementary school it went up to sixth grade. Sixth grade wasn't middle school yet, so um, yeah. So when I was eleven, I had entered a, a you know a county contest in Riverside County, and it was a art contest amongst like all the schools, all the elementary schools in Riverside County. It was something like a hundred and something kids, and um, I ended up winning first place, and that was like the first time I'd ever won like any real important like award like I got a ribbon that was the first ribbon I'd ever won and um you know it, it was crazy the mayor R Riverside was there and, and shook his hand and took pictures with the mayor and it was this big whole event you know I'm, I'm like you know 11 years old I'm, I'm thinking like I'm the star of the show and it was my first time I had my work in a gallery space and uh, I sold that piece to my aunt for like a hundred bucks my aunt bought it but it was still cool because it was like sold like you know it said sold and it was just like what the hell like it was just crazy it was just like my first taste of like what it meant to be um, you know, a working fine artist and, and a successful one at that. So that that was my first taste of it, and I and I got hooked. Like it was like again, like very addictive energy. Like I don't do drugs. I've never done any hardcore drugs. I've never done psychedelics. Um, I just I never had the the desire to do it. I mean, I've smoked weed. I drank occasionally, but I have an addictive personality when it comes to achievement. Whenever I achieve something, it's like that becomes super, super addictive. And that that day, I remember it became extremely addictive. Um, so that that's what spawned that. But I, I mean, I did graduate high school and I started tattooing when I moved to Texas. My mom's ex-husband um, had uh, enlisted in the army and he got stationed in Fort Hood. So we ended up moving to Texas in my junior year of high school. And while I was there, it was like right before my junior year. I was like 15 going on 16. And... Um, when I was there, everybody was just like, for some reason in my ear, pressuring me about doing tattoos. Oh, like, you know, the thing with my mom's side is like, they don't really know much about the fine art world. They don't really understand the scale or scope of like how successful you could become as an artist. I mean, they know who Picasso is and who Da Vinci is, and but they don't understand like there's artists who are so f wealthy and successful and fine are like Damien Hirst is, I mean, he's a billionaire. I mean, Jeff Koons is almost a billionaire. He's like worth like $800 million. You know what I mean? Like, so there's some real success and, and fine art. So, but they, they, they were unaware of that um, because they were just unfamiliar with the industry and to their knowledge or to their perspective, they figured that, okay, you're an artist and maybe if you do tattoos, you could become really successful. They thought that that was like maybe the next step and being a fine artist, like do tattoos and you can be really famous because they were very familiar with like Kat Von D. You know what I mean? So yeah, the like, commercialized stuff. Right. So so that's what they were familiar with. So they were like, do tattoos. You can become like super, you know, famous, wealthy, whatever. So I ended up uh, saving up money and buying my first like tattoo equipment. And I started tattooing like people like the next day, I think. You know, my first person I tattooed was my uncle. And I tattooed my cousin and then I tattooed my other cousin and then I tattooed my homie and then I tattooed my mom and then I tattooed my dad. Like, and, and just spiraled it like upward spiraled from there. Um, you know, I tried working in several shops. A lot of people um, turned a blind eye to me, didn't really want to work with me, didn't really take me serious and stuff. So I kind of, you know, I, I did work in a few shops and, and I almost apprenticed. I did apprentice for, um, you know, a pretty big artist and I was there for like three months, but. I left it just the environment wasn't for me. They were treating me like, shit. and I'm like, I get that, like being a grunt, you know, that you sometimes you're gonna get treated That's a, certain in that to a certain right. way, right? But yeah. I'm like, look, dude, I come, I'm like, I'm, I'm not from the 
in you know 70s 80s like yeah i don't have that like older person mentality like i'm 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 built different so i'm not going to take getting treated like for for nothing you know what i mean like there's no reason that for you to like treat me in a way and and i'm not even getting paid you know i'm here 7 days a week and i'm i'm an in, a free intern you know what i mean i'm interning without a pay and you're not even covering like gas or anything so it's like i'm not going to waste my time doing this so i left and that was like really like my last time that i tried to like do that and then I was working um at a shop when I moved back from Vegas. I went to college in Vegas and I moved back, worked at a shop for a little bit, and I ended up getting a job at Disney and like I just left the whole shop life. I was just like, you know, you know, I'm going to just do tattoos like freelance from home. I mean, I'm licensed, you know what I mean? So it's like I have my certification. I I have took I've taken my bloodborne pathogen tests and 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 I'm very like sanitary and precautious. So I know I I know what I'm doing, you know what I mean? Yeah. And well, I'm, it's I mean, it's funny, like people, everyone has an opinion on like what you should do. Right. Yeah. And a lot of times like they have no knowledge base on it, because if you look at like skateboarding the same way with me, people don't like when I told my parents I was going to open a skateboard shop, they didn't get it. And I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of people when I talk to them, they discount it as like it's it's a weird like side little hobby. Like when is this when are you, when are you going to be done with that? And I'm like, well, I, but I do own a legitimate business. Like it's an actual storefront. Why is it less respected than if I owned some other kind of business? Right. And it's just because they don't understand it. You know, you said earlier, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wonder if this is where this comes from. So you tend to want to, what, what you get when you're saying is like that accomplishment, it's mm -hmm. that addictive personality. Yeah. Yeah. How much of that though comes from like finally getting praise from something? Because um, that's an addictive thing too, right? You do stuff and you finally am get because I do painting too, right? Yeah. Not nearly on your level, but I paint. And, and and I remember the first time I sold one because I did a little art show at my shop just for fun. You know, I call, I think, I, what did I call it? Um, I call it amateur hour. It was just this fun little thing. So I like put up some of my stuff and people bought it and, you know, for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just like, whoa, you like my shit. And I feel like half, well, I shouldn't say half, but a good part of the reason why I continue to paint is just because I know my friends really like it. When I'm done with it, I like it. And some, one of my friends is stoked and ends up buying it for like in not a significant amount of money. Right. But I think it's that, I feel like the praise is part of why I enjoy it. Um, I, you know, it, it definitely is a driving factor. I like when you get praise, it feels great. Um, I think it was the time where I didn't get praise. That's where it comes from. Because not getting praise for something drives me harder than getting praise. It's like losing feels worse and winning feels good. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've always been the type of person where like when I lost at something or I felt like I didn't succeed, it didn't it didn't like put me down and make me give up. You know, it it drove me harder cuz I'm like, damn. I'm like, all right, you know, like I I took it as a, cha a challenge. You know, I I took it, everything as a challenge and I'm like, okay, like let me let me, let me figure this one out. You know what I mean? I wasn't good at math. I wasn't good at science. I wasn't good at at very, uh, you know, uh, scholastic, um, book smart stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I was good at English and, and poetry and, and things like that. Things that had to do with the creative part of the brain, not um, critical thing, you know, like the critical thinking and mathematics and numbers. That, that wasn't my skill. So it's like, I was tackling and taking everything as a challenge when it came to my creativity and like really being able to dive into that. So I think, yeah, I think, I think not having the praise and not having recognition is what really pushed me. Cause when I got praised, it felt good, but I'm like, eh, you know, even now when I, when I, when I sell a painting, I'm, I'm absolutely grateful for it, but I'm like, it's just, I'm like, I'd feel more inspired if I didn't sell a painting because now it's like, all right, let me, you know, it's like, it's just, I don't know. It's just that losing feeling is like a driving force. It's like I work harder when I'm not doing good or something. Right. You want to be competitive with yourself. You know, you want yeah. to feel like you haven't reached your peak. And when, right. there's, when you're getting that feedback that isn't, you know, this is your peak, yeah. then you're inspired to keep doing it. Yeah. When all you get is praise of people saying, you're doing fantastic. I kind of hate that too. And I tell people that I'm like, God, I can't wait. My show's going to blow up. It's going to do this because I just believe in this. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're doing great. And I'm like, I'm not doing what it could be. I know yeah. the potential is so much more. Yeah. And that kind of like gets me stoked. So your artwork's obviously everywhere, right? You do music and you do pencil drawings and you're doing stuff with animation. 
I, I love the new stuff that you've been doing. I've been following it at least for a little bit, especially because we made this connection. It was like, okay, now I got to go look through all this stuff. Um, your stuff that I really like is the stuff that almost looks renaissance kind of like older stuff, right? Like you did your version of the, of the Mona Lisa, that stuff, but then with like this street art vibe and those are all like oil paintings for the most part, right? Yeah. When, when did oil painting become your thing? And is that really like, I guess where you're trying to go? Is that like ultimately that's the medium that you prefer for artwork? Um, well, yeah, I, like, like you said, I've been doing pencil drawings since a kid. I was always doing pencil stuff. And uh, my dad's an artist too, and, and he, he does pencil, but only pencil. So by the time I was 18, I was already producing portrait work in pencil that was, you know, almost as good as my dad's stuff. So whenever we would exhibit together, people would mistake my work for his or his work for mine, but more nine out of 10 times my work for his. I really did. I was kind of living in my dad's shadow and I, and I didn't like that. I, I, you know, I mean, not that I was hating on my dad, but it was just like, I am my own person too. You know what I mean? I was trying really hard to have my own voice, not, not, not use my dad's identity to, you know, build up my identity. So when I, um, when I was 18, I ended up moving to Vegas to go be with my ex-girlfriend and, um, out of, trying to please her and her parents, I ended up uh, enrolling into uh, UNLV. And I was taking some uh, art classes there. And when I was when I got there, I realized I was far too advanced for any of the classes that they had to offer. So I was there for like two years, um, you know, doing pencil stuff. And one day I just, I was, I was honestly done. I just, I was like, I'm, I'm over this shit. So I dropped out cold turkey. And the day I dropped out, I went and you know, got my first uh, paint supplies, canvases and paints, and I just went in on painting. I painted every single day for a whole year. And on my second year of painting, I painted uh, the portrait of Tupac with the third eye that everybody knows today. Um, and I pretty much had like a four-year, you know, uh, in, you know, like a four-year, uh, what do you Degree. call it, scholarship, yeah, okay. you know, for free in one year because I painted every single day for a whole year. Yeah, I think that's the funny thing about college. You know, back in the day, they would show you those rates. I don't know if your parents did this, but mine did, where they would show you and say, look, the average person who has a bachelor's degree makes X amount more than mm -hmm. anybody else. Yeah. And you're like, damn, okay, so I have to have one. But it was kind of similar for me. So I started, uh, I was in sales since I was 16. That was my first sales job. And I've been doing that like forever. And I, I went to uh, school for business. And I'm taking these classes and I'm like, these are really irrelevant information. Mm -hmm. The only class that I found was useful to me at all was this class called interpersonal communication. And it, you know, it taught you how like through the internet, people perceive things differently mm -hmm. and how to carry yourself and, and whatever. And it just kind of like made me more aware of like how that stuff worked. But otherwise it was completely useless information to yeah. me. And I realized, hey, I could drop out. And if I want to work in sales, like I thought I did, I thought I want to work in sales and sales management, which eventually I own my own retail store. So I guess that makes sense. Um, but you can look at the dollars that you make of a store, right? You can look at it and say, okay, out of a 10 person team, I'm doing 30% of the volume of this store, which has X dollars. You can provide that to anyone you're looking for, you know, employment and say, you can expect these kind of numbers and you'll get paid based on those. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you have a degree is actually completely irrelevant mm -hmm. and yeah. with art whether or not you have a degree is also completely irrelevant it's yeah. whether or not people want to pay for what you're creating right mm -hmm. so when people can recognize that and sometimes you know they obviously don't have the same upbringing where they're doing art for a long time they don't even start doing art seriously till college so it takes them a while but it's it's cool that you didn't have to go through four maybe five years of schooling and start with a huge amount of debt right, and actually right. get into this stuff right so painting i know like so the tupac one's super sick I, okay really quick what, why the third eye? Because you were doing that for a while. Yeah, I, I, well, when I, when I decided to paint Tupac, you know, it was one of those. I had always wanted to do a portrait of Pac as, as a musician. That's been my, my biggest influence. Um, I've, you know, I've grown up on Tupac as a kid, and it was one of my favorite rappers as a kid. Um, so I really wanted to paint it, you know, someone that I admired and I idolized, and someone that was really important to me. So, um. I challenged myself. I said, I think I'm pretty good now, and I think um, I think I can do him justice. You know, if I, I I paint a really solid portrait, and I wanted to paint him in such a way that uh, really captured who he was as an individual, not just as a rapper. You know, I, I I've watched so many in Pac interviews. I remember when I was 17, I saw an interview of him when he was 17 and talking about some profound. Sh 
that was happening within society. And I'm like, dude, who is this 17 year old? Like talking, like look at this 17 year old talking about, I mean, I was just like blown away. Cause I grew up on Tupac as a kid, you know, I was like three years old rapping Tupac, you know? But like when I was 17, I was like, who is this Tupac? Like, where is this Tupac? You know what I mean? And it was just like, I related to another 17 year old. I didn't have a lot of friends. And I was like, this person is saying so much about society that we're not talking about. And like, it was just impressive. So, you know, I, I, the thing that came to mind was like, how could I describe him as like a profound individual, someone that, that perceived reality and life differently? And I was like, uh, third eye, you know, what I mean? so I, like I started doing research and studying about like the third eye and kind of looking into like enlightenment. And it really means that it means enlightenment. It means that, you know, you're, you're pretty much like disconnected from like death and, and life. And you're just, you're more like maybe even more connected, even not disconnected, but connected with life and death. And like you, you, once you get over ego and you drop everything it's like you're enlightened you know what I mean and I felt like Tupac was we nothing could affect him you know he was he was this unpenetratable being I mean it was this person that you know um he could be totally unbothered and and he had his you know extremely profound perspective on on life and reality and society so that's how the, the third eye concept came up and when I painted that I ended up painting um a portrait of Biggie just like it. And that Biggie painting ended up going to Dizzy, uh, P. Diddy's collection. Yeah, which is so crazy. So no. the, th the third eye thing, just to finish that one, you did a, a series, right? You did Michael Jackson and you did Biggie and you did, was it Frida? I don't know who I, all I did. I did Frida, P uh, Picasso, Basquiat, Da Vinci, A Self-Portrait, Bruce Lee. Um, I did, yeah, Michael Jackson, Biggie, Tupac. Um, I know there's probably a couple of was that inspired series. though because you felt all of those individuals had that same general trait because they were really special yeah, oh, yeah, in, in that way absolutely that yeah I, I did a show called Vision and it was pretty much like they all had a vision right and they all I mean, I felt, they felt like they were all profound in their yeah, own can right. Can you imagine if Tupac lived longer like <laughs> what kind of perspective that man would have had by 50 he would have like uh, we don't even need to go down that rabbit hole, but it, it, it incredible human. And at the age that he died is yeah. like, what like more could you, I think. Right, what more could you have given to the world if yeah. you actually had a reasonable amount of time? You know, I was thinking about this today. It's funny we're saying this because while I was tattooing, uh, my homie was listening to uh, a Tupac um, radio on Pandora. So I was listening to nothing but Tupac before I got here. And um, I was thinking about it like, damn, if Tupac was alive, like, I wonder where music would be right now. You know what I mean? Like, you ever yeah. see those memes that have, like, like, it was like, if, if Tupac, if, like, Tupac saying, like, if I was alive right now, no one would know who Lil Wayne is or some shit like that. You know what I mean? I'm like, damn, dude, like, if Pac and Biggie were still around, I wonder if they would have had the same impact on hip hop as they would have, you know, having died, you know, cause I feel like, when, when someone dies young, it's like, damn, dude, like you could have given us so much more, but we realize what you did give us. Yeah. You know, what you gave us was so like, you drop gems on us. You don't realize what you have until you lose it. Right. So it's like, you know, a lot of people go and appreciate it, but I definitely think that they would have done some dope for the culture. I mean, they probably would have done some, uh, Tupac would have done some real activist work for I sure. So. You know what I mean? For the community. I mean, for the black community in particular, you know? I think one powerful thing about that, though, is to look at that age and be like, look at what this man was able to do. Yeah. What now, if you look at them and you compare yourself and you say, like, yeah, I'm not ever going to be Tupac, but you can compare it and say, look, in that amount of time, he accomplished all this yeah. and like inspired so many people. I need to do more with my life because I have all of this opportunity to do it. And it's really, for me, I find it to be really motivating. I, so I, just for your artwork, because I really, I don't want to, I guess I don't want to say I want to focus on it, but I really like your artwork. Thank if, you. I, the fact that Diddy has one of yours is like nuts. And I guess part of that is like you're out in this zone of the world in Wisconsin that that would never happen. Regardless how good you are, Diddy would never see anything. You know what I mean? But right. the fact he has that, that's so sick. I know you look up to Tupac, obviously. If Tupac were alive and you can give him a piece that you've done up to this point, what piece of yours would you give to him and why? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, damn. That's a really, uh, you know what? I'd have to really think about that one. Maybe one of my angel pieces, maybe, you know, because I, I feel like it's so raw and it's so like, 
it's it's just very thug, you know. That's I mean, that's how I pretty much the new body of work that I'm doing right now. I'm coming at it with a very like thuggish attitude, you know. I that that's a whole nother like conversation in and in, in and of itself. Um, but I think I would give him one of those because I felt like it, it's poetic and, and 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 thuggish at the same time. Like it's thug life. Like it's like you know, like f- this f- that. Like I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do regardless. And, and I got and I got a message behind it. And if you don't f- with it, well then. F- you and I'm gonna do it anyway, type. Shit. So it's like I felt like maybe he would feel that in that work. You know what I mean? I wouldn't do anything like give him anything that involved like music or like or like you know black community or anything like that. Like because I would give him something that was so um, unfamiliar, you know, but like also resonating. And I feel like he would have such an open mind for people. Like I mean, this is all just speculation, yeah. but listening to his music, I feel like he must have just been an incredibly kind and understanding and empathetic uh, person. Uh, but, but uh, you know, whatever. That's all just speculation. I'm, I'm sure he was uh, cool as hell. I mean, one of my favorite videos of, of Pac is where he's walking on the sidewalk and he sees a little kid and, and everybody speculated that this kid was Tyler the Creator because he looks like Tyler the Creator. Yeah. But, he, you know, Tupac is walking and he's like, hey, hey hold up, man. So, 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 someone's, so, someone's eyeballing me, man. Like, someone's getting mad dogging me. And he's like, I don't know, man. Look, look at this. You just look at this. Look at this man. And you don't see the kid yet. The camera's still on Tupac. He's like, look at this man just, just eyeballing me. Like, see, you got to watch out because you never know who's trying to pull up on you. Like, saying some shit. Like, and the camera turns out, and it's just this little kid. And he's like, <laughs> he's like see, see, I, I could go back up to him. Him, and I can confront this man, but I'm gonna let him be because I don't know what he got with him. So I'm gonna <laughs> keep it moving. You know? And it's super funny because it's like, but it's like he's, you know, the super playful person at the same time of this, like, you know, I think Pac was, I, I mean, Pac was as gangster as like one could want to be. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, I wouldn't, you know, consider, and Pac's no killer. You know what I mean? But, and the, you know, there's real murderers in, in, in like that out there but like i don't consider those people gangster i, I consider those people like you know confused in life and you yeah. know uh, tupac was gangster because the, the way he went about his life was gangster i mean it, like everything he did was super g whether you f- with it or not so it's like even though like he was this g person there was this very like poetic you know family oriented person there was this kid like searching for like you know um something more in life and i felt like I resonated with the same thing. Like, like, you know, Pac's mom did drugs too. I mean, my, my mom was on drugs at one point in my life. And like, you know, I seen all that shit up close. I mean, I, I've, I've been around the, the domestic violence, you know, some of the gang violence. I've seen some of that, like, you know what I mean? Like not to the degree where people are like, oh, you, what, what do you know? Like, like you don't need to worry about what I know. I've seen enough to, to, to know what, what's what where i want my life to go in what direction you know what I'm right saying? Like, well and the lesson you're supposed to pull from that anyways is empathy for others right yeah. so who the f- cares if some it's not a competition about how horrible somebody's life was right oh yeah not it's at just all. about saying like hey i'm aware that this exists as a problem yeah. so like coming from me as just like a white dude in wisconsin right i can't i can't relate to black lives matter in that kind of way yeah, but that yeah. doesn't mean that i need to ignore it i can also say hey i have empathy for you that sucks i recognize that there's a problem i can't yeah. really relate because i'm not from that right, but right. I, I feel i feel what you're saying and i right. respect you for it yeah. i want to i want so you're talking about your your music you know your art's getting more thuggish the west side gun is like a big well he must be a, just a personal friend at this point i would assume right but like uh, how did I, I call him a personal friend yeah, yeah i call him a personal friend how so how did you get involved in like the music side and do you think like now that you just made that song with benny and stuff like yeah do you do you think it's because you're rapping and stuff now that your art is taking on that thuggish thing at this point actually no i've, I've been rapping since i was a kid oh okay I, so my my stepdad who's passed away rest in peace um he came in my life when I was like nine and he was a rapper and a singer. And I'm, when I tell you that this man can rap and sing, I mean, he can rap and freestyle for like nonstop. Like he was an amazing freestyler and he was also like a street drummer. So he used to like be really good at like getting pencils and pens and just like tapping it and like creating a beat on a spot. And like he could sing like gospel like he would sing like gospel type music, like Neo. You know, Neo was a gospel singer, like a choir singer before he even started doing like, you know, solo, like pop, 
music and, and R&B. So I was just blown away by that. Like I never had any, like my, the only other person that did music in my family was my, my dad's dad, but he was like, you know, in, in a mariachi band. And, and even though I resonated with that as a kid, but like that wasn't the stuff that like spoke to me. So having this person up close to me, like rapping and singing, like it just blew my mind as a kid. And I just started rapping. I mean, like I even remember the first bars that I wrote when I was nine, you know what I mean? And like, that I don't know that was just like it's so incredibly like inspiring to me and like I just ran with it and I would practice and I would write more and more and I'd always been into poetry but I never really thought of my poetry as like as like rapping you know what I mean I'm like I, I didn't know like I could do this you know what I mean so I had started doing that and then the first time I like recorded music I was probably like 13 you know my one of my cousin's boyfriends had uh, like pirated like uh like uh fruity loops onto my computer with like lime wire and stuff all these like bread torrents and stuff so i had um fruity loops on my 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 computer and i started making beats when i was like 13 and i started rapping on my own beats and stuff and like that it just as years went by it progressed and progressed and it got like heavier and heavier and i i'd always done music i mean i was that kid in like high school like starting ciphers and like I, like that was like my like that's what i grew up on like being from la like hip hop was my first music, you know what I mean? Like hip hop and rock and roll. So that was, um, you know, what really resonated with me. And I never really like try to present to Westside that I do music, even when I met him, you know, like how that happened was he DM'd me on Instagram. He saw my work in, a, in, a, in an online magazine that I had submitted my work to. And he hit me up the same day that they posted it. And, you know, he was looking to collect some work. And, and instead of collecting some work, he actually commissioned me to do an album cover. And he collected that, the original work. So that's how that relationship uh, spawned. And um, he's been an avid collector since. I mean, the work that I create for him, um, you know, his fans are super diehard. I've never seen fans like his fans. I mean, his fans are, are just as crazy as Michael Jackson fans. They really are. You know what I mean? Like, even though he's not super, 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 like, known right now, like, you know, he's got a cult following. But that following is still humongous. And... Um, you know, when I create artwork for the albums, it's like his fans, it's like they correlate the, the artwork with the music. When they listen to these the certain tracks from a certain album, and if it's an album that I did the cover for, they think of the artwork that correlates with that album. Or when they see my artwork, they think of the music. So it's like you can't have one without the other. So it's like they really do that shit. Like they really like are into it for both, you know what I mean. And Westside loves art. He has a massive collection of art. It's crazy. And he's and he's um, I mean Diddy, I would say is my biggest collector as far as like status goes. But Westside is by far my most like avid collector. He owns like twenty of my paintings. So the big one that you're referring to, right, is the one. So I guess I gotta wonder where this one comes from too. It's the one that has like the smiley face thing on it, right? Of was it is, was it a Mona Lisa thing? What was the cover? Can you describe the cover? you're talking about which one um the first main one the one he hit you up about so the history. first cover that i did for Westside was a portrait of chris benoit for his supreme his supreme blind tell album that came out in like 2018 so that was the very first cover that i did for him then i did a few of other little covers for him in between for his like you know his mixtape series and then i did some i just did some uh paintings for him for him to release on clothing i do a lot of stuff like that for him too where you know we'll co we'll he'll come up with an idea and i'll design something for like merchandise and he'll put it on a, a hoodie or a t-shirt or a crew neck or a hat or something so all those pieces were amazing but it wasn't up until last year that i created the first piece to this new work that i'm doing and it was a rendition of mona lisa with a smiley face and um, it's a little mixture of like realism and like this abstract expressionistic street art stylistic like form of art. And um, that really blew up. Like when I mean it blew up, I mean it blew up in my, in my face. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it really went like into wildfire. His fans went crazy over it. Um, he made it like a run of like a hundred prints. Those sold out in nanoseconds. You know what I mean? Like it was crazy. So I started running with that. Like, I don't, I mean, if you want, do you want to go into like how that came about that? Piece? Yeah, I would love to know because there, you obviously have been incorporating that into a lot of stuff and I love it, but I want to know what I have a hard time with like loving something, but if I don't understand where it comes from, I feel yeah. like a poser, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like no, I want to know why I like, 
Well, long story short, I mean, to, to sum uh, as much information as I can up, uh, you know, I spent my entire life trying to learn how to paint realistic. My, my perception of, of fine art was, uh, or success as a fine artist was you had to paint realistic. That was my premature perception on, on the fine art world, which is um, false. You don't have to, you know, paint super realistic. And I, and I can paint really realistic. I mean, and I'm not saying that to brag or, or to be cocky or anyway. I'm just speaking the, the facts. Like, well, you can look I, at the Tupac one well, even not way even, back then. Not even know? that one. I mean, I have a, a still life that I did that's pretty photorealistic. And, um, you know, I can paint to that caliber and I, and I know I can even get better at, at it, but I mean, none of that stuff ever really sold. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 as an artist, I love creating artwork for the love of it, but, but I'm also trying to make it into a career and it's important to sell. Otherwise you're never going to be taken serious in the real fine art world, you know, in, in the, in the actual fine art world, not just like these local galleries and, and stuff like, no, no, no. Well, I'm talking about the real dealers and the people like who are directors of museums and, and publishers. Uh, all over the world and stuff so real collectors collectors who are owning like fucking Picassos and Basquiat's and Warhols and Herrings and de Kooning's and, right. and really serious collections you know so I want to enter in that world so you know up until last year all my work is very realistic and then uh, we went into what? We went into quarantine on March 14th or something like that and then like for a month from March 14th to like mid-April I didn't paint shit I didn't paint nothing. I was just so depressed. My dad moved in with me. I was just stuck in this little in one bedroom apartment. I was like losing my mind. Like I, I just didn't want to touch brushes. I, I just was like sleeping every day, just not doing shit. And I got so depressed to the point where like uh, one night I just started like drinking by myself. I just started throwing back beers, throwing back a couple shots, getting loose. I'm not a smoker. So I felt like that was my way to just kind of like get loose and feel a little numbness got really f***ed up alone and uh, I had a spare canvas laying around and I ended up like just f***ing going ham on this canvas. I ended up painting that Mona Lisa. And as soon as I was finished painting it, you know, I threw my brushes down and like I took a step back and I was like, yo, what the f*** is this? <laughs> I was like completely like in a trance and like REM sleep. Like I was like on autopilot painting this thing. I was like lucid or some sh you know what I mean? I don't know what even to describe it at whatever state I was in, but I didn't recall painting it. I just remember seeing the finished product and I was like, what the f is this? I'm like, this looks nothing like I would have ever created. Smiley faces? I'm like, what the? I've never put fucking smiley faces in my work. Like, I've never even used spray paint really in my work um, or to this degree. You know, I've used a little bit, but I'm like, this is different. I'm like, this is, this is real different. So I, I, I took a picture of it and it's funny because in the picture that I took, like you could see her like beer bottles all around it. Like, you know, just like I'm in, barefoot in my, in the living room of my, my apartment. And I send it to West Side Gun and, and I said, uh, something like, yo, this, this, uh, I'm, I'm getting faded by myself and this quarantine got me painting different. Right. And West Side immediately was like, yo, I need that. And I was like, it's yours if you want it. So, so he, he bought it. And uh, um, lo and behold, it became uh, the alternate cover for his album, Pray for Paris. And, and the main cover was done by Virgil Abloh. And I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I love Virgil, but I, I could tell you that a lot of people preferred my cover over <laughs> Virgil's. You know what I'm saying? And which, and it's crazy because Virgil's dope as too. And I, and I love the guy. But um, yeah, I think people were just really blown away and like resonated with this work. And that's how it came about. Just one drunken, depressed, aggressive, frustrated night. And I ran with it and the work started selling really fast. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, there's a couple things to that, um, really. First, uh, there's a reason that people do microdosing and do different things. Mm -hmm. and, and, or, I mean, same reason that people like take a break and fly to Hawaii to write or yeah. whatever. Like when you put yourself in a different situation, and I'm not telling people go get drunk in the pain. No, but, absolutely. But when you put yourself into a different, you know, state with your mind, you look at things a little bit differently and different things will come about it, you know. And sometimes it's important to do that just to mm -hmm. try to like gain some kind of inspiration for like what else exists. And here's the other thing. So I paint all the time and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you my dumb little paintings. I paint stupid little monsters that are all goofy looking and cute and uh, whatever. I really like doing them. But, yeah. but you know, I, I sell all of mine, um, usually anyways. And I always tell, like I talk myself down with it where I'm like, they're not very good. Cause I don't think like if you actually look skill wise that they would be that crazy hard to reproduce. They're not that good. 
good. Right. But that's not the point. That's really not the point. Because when I look at my favorite artist, which, who I'm trying to get on the show, so Lucas Buford, listen to the show, and then come on the show. But Lucas Buford is this um, French painter. I mm-hmm. believe he's from France. And I discovered him when I was in Japan. He did some artwork for my buddy Bugs, um, who owns a skateboard shop out there. So this dude's involved in skateboarding. Um, and his the thing that I saw, it was like a big like picture like some some photographer took a picture of some skate photo and then he painted these weird little creatures on it and i was like what is that and yeah. i love it so he's and he's been my favorite artist since yeah if you actually look at it i feel like it wouldn't be that hard to actually do but that's not the point right the point is when i look at it it's him that did that and it's right. obvious that it's him that did that and i think that's really important for people to like recognize you know within art that yes there's a lane for who can paint the most realistic thing ever but that's not the point because then you're just copying what has been done to a certain degree when you can do something totally unique like that right. and it has your voice that's when i think think it really propels you to another level within art am i totally wrong in speaking no no yeah for sure yeah okay so just to okay a couple other things quick to touch on um when was it that art was like obvious to you that that was going to be your full career was there an age because you sold that at 11 but then you went and did stuff with disney and you went to school what when was it that you were like okay art no matter what this is how i'm going to do my career birth birth (laughs) i i I, and I and I say this with all honesty, and it sounds far fetched or or um, typical, or you know, it sounds cliche. Even that's a better word to say. But um, as a kid, I've always known that I was going to do this. I, I I didn't want to do anything else. I, I didn't want to do anything else other than being a creative, you know. And as I got older, I got into music. And I got into tattoos and I got into acting and modeling and doing clothing. Um, anything that I can get my hands on that, that, that involves creativity and sort of, you know, escaping from reality and, and escaping to my own reality. I, I really um, crave that. And I, I did, I, I couldn't never, I could never see me working like a blue collar, white collar job or um, going to school. And like, I honestly, I, I, I didn't mind school because I didn't mind the social aspect of school. I really loved the so like the social aspect of going to school. Even as a kid, I just didn't give a fuck about anything that I was learning because I didn't think I was going to use it. I'm like, why am I learning about, you know, the the Holocaust? I'm not going to use it. I mean, just tell me to respect everybody. And I promise I will respect everybody. You know, I, I, and this history is like, I get the history is important, but I'm like, I'm learning about like um, American history that is going to have like no effect to like, you know, learning about sciences that, that I'm not going to end up using. Like, when am I ever going to use chemistry? When am I ever going to use uh, trigonometry, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, unless I'm trying to be an architect, you know, I'm use some algebra, you know what I mean? But didn't have any desire to use any of this stuff. So I, I'd always, I'd always was determined to become successful, and I, I, I'm not considering myself successful yet. You know, I'm, I'm doing decent for myself. Um, a lot. I, I know that if I were to look at myself uh, five years ago and look at where I'm at now, I definitely would be like. Yeah, put me there. Dude, well, ultimately, success is whether or not you're happy. That's all it comes down to. It, yeah. it doesn't matter what other people think. If currently you're making enough money to do the things that you want to be doing and you feel good about where you're at, you're successful. That's mm. how I view it. It's a very black and white in that yeah. way. Can you yeah. be more successful? Sure, like you can get more accomplished and you can earn more money and all that. And right. it's not that you don't want to do that. But ultimately, if you're if you're happy doing what you're doing, then yeah, you're successful for so so hell yeah. I would I would say though, um, with the degrees and everything else, I agree, especially when it comes to like I took calculus in college and I, completely irrelevant information. I'll literally never use it. Um, but I do appreciate what like a four year degree can teach you as far as like having an overall understanding of things. Right? You it's, yeah, you're yeah, more well balanced as a person because like when I, I found through the show. Like realistically, how much? Like I'm not going to do any music, right? So yeah. I could sit here and talk to you about music all day. None of that information is going to really be pertinent as far as like how I'm going to grow within my career. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't think so. But I'm still just learning more stuff, you know. And I still think that like that is useful to a certain degree, right? Um, so yeah, I love where you're at with it. I, just because I don't want to glaze over it entirely, music is something a lot of my friends have been trying to do forever. Like it's really hard to get into music. Benny the Butcher getting him on a on a track is like you must be doing something right so when when like was there a turning point within music where all of a sudden you had like a little break with it is it honestly just like your side thing that you really enjoy doing but 
that that's not the point right now you're focused on painting and this is your other creative outlet like what is where are you at um it's, it's a little bit of all things i mean i really now i'm taking my music to another serious level by you know taking on a team you know a new producer um engineer and and kind of you know music management um per se and i and i would have loved for westside to have like you know taken notice to my music but i wasn't worried about that i wasn't concerned i've always been very serious about doing music i love doing music um you know as much as i love doing art and and same thing with like my acting and modeling like i love doing this stuff um i need it i have to do it otherwise um i wouldn't be satisfied in life it's it's a vice that i i need you know it's a drug uh, it's a prescription you could even look um it's like vitamins i need them to be balanced but the whole situation with Benny, you know, I had uh, did a painting for him um, for some merch and, you know, he became a collector and him and his team, you know, they, they just were like, um, I mean, would you want Benny to get on track? And and at the time I was like, what the fuck? Like, I didn't even know that that was a possibility. Like, like, and, and it's, and you guys are offering, like, you know, you guys are the one, you know, interested in it. So that, that was like really like left field. And I was like, dude, uh, yeah, I'd love to get Benny on a track. Like, of course. Like, why wouldn't I'm like, really? He wants to like he would be down to get on a track with me? Like, really? And um, yeah, it happened pretty organically. I mean, I didn't bother asking. I never bugged anyone. And I was just like, dude. So I ended up, you know, producing the beat, mixing and mastering it, and engineering it myself. Um, he sent me his vocals from, you know, I think I don't know, he might have recorded it in Atlanta or Buffalo, but he sent me his vocals and I I chopped it up and I mixed it, mastered it, engineered it myself, and produced the beat and put it out myself, and did the cover artwork. Yeah, I mean, well, congratulations! It was super, super sick, and I think <laughs> that's going to help you like moving forward for sure. Um, one thing, you know, it's funny. I was talking to Andrew Cannon. I think he was really the one that cemented this in my mind. But coming from like a smallish town in Wisconsin, you don't. If you see somebody that even has like ten thousand followers on Instagram, you're like, this dude's famous. You know what yeah. I mean? Or even if you meet somebody that's on the radio, you're like, oh my god, you're that dude or the yeah. Weather Channel, or whatever. You know. But I was talking to him, and he was really explaining how. It's powerful. It makes sense. But like people don't get it. People are just people. Everyone is just another person. They're not cooler than you. You're not cooler than them. They just do something different with their life than what you do. But everybody has somebody to offer everybody else and everybody's just a person. Yeah. And Instagram kind of broke that, that wall down, right? Yeah. Where all of a sudden, like I was messaging my, my friend Miles Boulevard, who is a rapper, who I'll show you his tracks, actually. You'll probably like him. But he's a good friend of mine from back home. Um, and he follows you and posted, I think he posted something to your story or to his story about you, like reposted, whatever. And anyway, so I DM'd him and I was like, Isaac's tight. I'm going to interview him tomorrow. And he was like, what? How in the world did you do that? That's so fucking sick. And I'm like, I, I don't know. You could just like DM people. I mean, ah, through dude. me, like we have a mutual friend. Yeah. But, but I mean, in general, like I've Such actually, yeah, I've had a me. lot of people that I just DM yeah, and yeah. they just respond. Like yeah. people are available and they're real people. Or email me something. Right. I, get it. Like, I have, there's could, my numbers, my, my page is a business page. So my numbers listed on there as well. So you can text me. I mean, you can call me and email me. Yeah, it's crazy. You could, See, hit up one of my followers who follows me and I'm I know and be like yo connect me with like you there's there's no reason to not get a hold of me I mean yeah, yeah I the mean, barriers are so much less like they're not as much there as people like think that they're there right right you know unless I mean? like my dms are super flooded like my requests they're, they're like I sure dude they, they they just they keep coming in and there's so much stuff so if you come up in my requests and I'm like I don't see it then like your message could probably get lost but absolutely, like you just hit me up. I mean, there's no reason for you to like, like ever anyone to ever be like hesitant. Like I always DM people, and like you know, I mean, it's not for like those reasons, like where I'm trying to get something out of the like right something, but like you know, I, just reaching out to people is so easy. I mean, it's right. not hard at all. You know, DMing, commenting on them, tagging in something. It's like it definitely breaks down those barriers to be able to like, oh, you can't. Uh, you know, it's like Instagram is very accessible. You know, it allows you to like be able to reach out to these very important people and like, you know. Well, and I would encourage like, I don't, I don't know about you, but it doesn't matter like how anything goes like with my skateboard shop or, or whatever. I, it always feels good when somebody reaches out to you and says that they right. enjoy something you do. It yeah. doesn't matter how many of them you've gotten. Yeah. So I'm sure you would appreciate every single time that somebody reaches out and says, dude, yeah. I love the new painting, right? It's so weird. Every All single time I'm like, dude, what the f I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, why are you like, I'm like, you're doing something that I would do to like 
one of my like idols or fans or some or something someone someone that like I would am a fan of you know like it's weird to get people to like message me and be like dude I fucking love your work or like people would be like uh, you've inspired me to pick up a brush and pencil and that's like that's why I do this. Shit. You know, I mean, that's a reason why I do. That's one of them. I mean, I remember being inspired by some of my favorite artists and, and being, you know, I just want, I would want, like, one of my favorite artists, and it's funny, I just posted something about him today. Um, you know, my biggest, one of my biggest influences as a kid was Shepard Ferry. And um, long story short, Shepard and I, uh, our paths have been crossed so much to the point where we ended up exhibiting at the same uh, group show and he bought my piece the night of the show. So um, I would consider Shepard a, a friend now because he, you know, he emailed me today congratulating me for the Insider article, which he sent a quote to them for talking about my work. So it's like I, to have someone like that you know, be uh, considered a friend now and be con- a collector even, it's, it's crazy because now I'm like, now I'm not DMing him or messaging him, like hoping that he responds. It's like, hey, dude, how you doing today? Like, so you doing surreal. good? Like, yeah, it's like, I, I'm like, yeah, like, I hope you and the family are good. Like, yeah. how's everything going? You doing all right? Like, what, what, what's what's new with you? Um, anything coming up? Like, you know, fill me in on what, so I don't miss out on anything. It's like a very casual, nonchalant conversation now. So when people are excited that like I respond or or like I open or see a message or I love like going through like my tagged photos and then liking what people tag me in, and then they get excited that I've seen it. And I'm like, dude, of course, like, why wouldn't I like, what? like, unless you're tagging me some dumb shit, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah, but yeah. like, yeah, like I love that. Shit. Some It's a, one of the weird, I know this is going to be really fucking pretentious, but like I'll go to the hashtag Isaac Palio because sometimes people won't tag me, but they'll hashtag whatever it is that they're posting and they'll hashtag my name and then I'll like their post and they'll be like, dude, I'm like, God, like, how did you see this one? Well, you hashtagged my name, bro. So yeah, I mean, I even just love when I see people like tag my store, like they bought something, oh, something or whatever, yeah, and they tag yeah. my store, and I'm like, I love when people I'm are like, dude, like I copped it. a new T-shirt with your artwork on it, blah blah blah. Or people always send me like messages of other random people wearing my shit public, yeah. and they're like, dude, look what I saw today. Or look, you know, some they'll see my artwork somewhere, and they're like, dude, look where I seen this, and like I've had people wear my shirts in London, and people send me like music videos of like people you know like rappers like in london wearing my t-shirts and i've never even heard of them. like no no yeah it's crazy so gaining recognition in the art world seems to be the most common struggle for a lot of artists right you obviously got some attention right away with you know one year in with that uh tupac thing but um you're you're doing well like you went from 20k following to over 100k following you've just been in a bunch of magazines if people look you up your name's kind of everywhere right now that doesn't mean challenges are gone Right. It right. doesn't. I, it, there's there's that idea that, and it's true that happiness um, always gets adjusted. Right. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter how much money you make after a certain point. You know, when you you have this amount of money, after a few months or whatever, you kind of come back down to your new normal. You get used to it. Right. You get used to yeah. it. So however far you are in it, you still get back to your new normal, and then you end up having challenges come up because you're trying to do new, sh- trying right. to get better. Yeah. Right now, what are the main challenges that you're trying to figure out, overcome that you're dealing with? Well, I, I think right now in my career, I'm I'm just now seeing real a uh, real taste of success. Um, you know, I think I'm doing a decent enough well for myself. I'm you know 24. I don't have an art dealer. Um, up until recently, I, you know, I just got representation from a gallery, but even then, still, I'm I'm selling my work directly through me. Out, you know, the, the work that they don't have. Um, it, you know, that the work is is being sold directly through me no middleman. So I'm collecting, you know, a hundred percent of what I, what I'm selling for, which is great because, you know, typically a gallery takes 50%, a dealer take like 10 or 20%, um, so on and so forth. So I'm collecting everything. You know what I mean? I put the price tag in and I'm being the sales guy, you know, I'm being the manager, the promoter, um, all of that stuff. Uh, but now that I'm getting a taste of that and now I'm like sustaining that it, it, or I'm kind of sustaining that the point now the challenge is how do I keep this going? How do I how do I continue to build to like, keep this boat afloat and get it bigger? You know what I mean? That's the challenge. It's like, all right, I'm here. I've entered the race. How do I keep up the pace? Yeah, you don't want to just be one firework that like boom, you're here and then it's gone next year. Because <laughs> yeah, it's gonna happen no. so 
fucking quick. It can happen so fast. Yeah. So I can only imagine there's no stability. I mean, you have to make yourself a stable career, but it's so hard to have stability in it, that stuff. So I feel it's for you. scary. But I'm gonna tell uh, for anyone listening to, and even for you, like you cannot think about, am I gonna be able to do this a year from now or whatever? Don't you can't worry about shit like that because right. you might die tomorrow. So who gives a f- what happens in a year from now? Think about what might happen tomorrow. You might not be here tomorrow. Why are you stressing about something a year or 10 years from now when you might not even see that? You know what I mean? Like worry about today. Worry about the the, the present day, the, the people that are around you now and, and just focus on what you're doing today. Just do, do good work, hard work, consistent work and work from authenticity. That's all that matters. If you, even if you, you know, Van Gogh never saw success in his lifetime, but, but he did it anyway. If you have that attitude, that'll, that you'll have a bigger, a higher chance of reaching success and and doing successful things with that kind of mindset than always worrying and, and, and trying to figuring out, trying to figure out the how, the how doesn't matter. The why doesn't necessarily matter either. It's, it's the, just the doing the work and, and that consistency is consistency is, I just posted, I just posted this on my story the other day. You know, consistency can even beat talent. There could be people in, you know, Da Vinci meets Tupac meets in the best ballerina dancer on the planet. I mean, people beyond talented, but so a lot of people are lazy. They don't want to do hard work. I mean, if anybody, uh, if everyone who knows me knew the amount of work that I invest, I mean, I'm in the studio until like four or five in the morning, you know, and then, and then my days, I did, was doing a back tattoo before I even came here. You know, I might do another tattoo after this. I might go home and paint. Um, you know, my, my work days are just crazy crammed with stuff and 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 it it works for me but you have to be so relentless about your work ethic it, it's you got to be working harder than anyone around you and not to say that like you got to focus on who's around you don't worry about who's around you just work harder than what you were yesterday and don't burn yourself out. Give yourself a break. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to like recuperate your mind. I take breaks. Sometimes I won't paint for like a week or, you know, I mean, I try not to go that long without painting because I, I feel stupid when I go that long without painting, but you do need a break. Sometimes you absolutely need to come and get some inspiration. When I'm taking a break from painting, I'm working on music. Right. And if I'm not working on music, I'm, I'm working on some collabs or something with clothes or something. So I'm like taking a break from one thing, but I'm also working on another so it's like, all right, let me take a break from this I'll, and I'll come back to it. You That's know? kind of the beauty of when you have, like like entrepreneurs are like that. When you have yeah. multiple eggs kind of going, multiple yeah. projects, you don't get too burnt out then. And I, I would agree no. that the saying I like to live by, and I've said it before on the show, I don't know where it came from, is plan for tomorrow, but live for today. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're screwed tomorrow, right? Yeah. But but don't make that the priority. Worry about today. Yeah. Worry about enjoying where you're at right now right. because that's never going to be guaranteed. Yeah. And, I, and I completely agree with, with you when you're talking consistency. And, and what I tell people a lot of times too is the market for anything is oversaturated. So don't just like throw garbage out there. But really what I mean by that is if you do your consistent best every time, you're naturally going to continue to get better and better and better and better. And that's what you got to focus on. Not necessarily like millions of content, just like your best that you can do Mm -hmm. with the time that you have quality. Like it's people will notice, people will notice what's happening. It's like a boxing match. I mean, if you go in the ring and you give it your best, I mean, honestly, some people don't even give a, this is about losing sometimes if they know that you're a dedicated fighter. I mean, like, you know what I mean? I know there's there's a fine line for people who are like really big boxing fans and they're probably saying, not winning's winning, which I get. Yeah, like Mayweather's undefeated. He's the best. But like you look at some fighters who are like relentless, even though they've lost, like look at like McGregor. Like he's a relentless fighter. Like the dude is an animal. But even though he's lost some matches, like you still don't give him less respect, you know what I'm saying? Right. And like he still is like super consistent and he and like it's like it crazy. almost makes him more relatable. And people yeah, like that. You absolutely. Know what I mean? people, people like one hundred yeah, because unrealisticness right. is like hard to relate to. So right. people are always gonna relate to the real sh- and like sometimes losing or or failure or not you know, or lacking some success is like, it's normal. It's common. That happens. Like that's nothing to be ashamed of or disappointed in or not. You you should look forward to failure even because when there's lessons in failure, there's lessons in not reaching quick success right away. There's lessons in that. 
people who reach quick success, it honestly doesn't really last because they skip all those lessons and all those values. Quick success is like giving a kid a handful of money. Right. They're not going to know what the to do with it. Right. It's, it's the whole idea of you have to teach somebody how to fish, not give them one, right? Exactly. It's, it's how you yeah. learn. So you've been, I like obviously, that. you're still, you know, 24. So you have like so much more to learn oh, regardless so of like how well you're doing, which is kind of awesome, right? Because then it's like, damn, my ceiling's really high. I, I, I like to assume a, that there isn't one. <laughs> I, I'm going to uh, throw something in there uh, to respond to that. I actually have this irrational fear of dying young. And not, it's not a fear that I'm afraid of dying young. It's I'm, a, I'm afraid that I am going to die young. And, and, and it's, I don't know how to explain that. It's not, you know, people say, well, what, can you picture yourself as an old person? And, and if you can, then you're not going to die young. And I'm like, it's not that I can't picture myself as an old person. It's that something like inside has always given me this sort of like, you don't have a lot of time, you know, left. And, and if you waste today, that's that's disappointing. So it's like I, I had this hardcore sense of urgency. That's why I like work hard every single day. Cause it's like if I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to, if I do what I'm supposed to do right now, then I'll be good. Like like I will I'll I'll leave behind some good shit. Because right. what if I died like what if I die tomorrow? You know what I mean? Right. It's like, damn, am, am I really gonna be satisfied with 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 what I've done so far? I I, I don't know, probably not. Cause I feel like there's so much more I could have done. And and it's not that I'm afraid to die or afraid how I'm going to die. It's more just like, damn it, I, I don't have a little more time. You know what I mean? If I just knew people, you know that question uh, people ask, like, would you rather want to know how you die or when you die? I'd rather want to know when I die. So I know that like, all right, this is what I'm working with. Cool. Then let me. Oh, I totally agree. Because you want to know how best can you spend your time. It's that fear. It's not the fear of missing out for like an opportunity for whatever. It's the fear of missing out on doing your best and leaving yeah. behind what you can. Right. And, and, and it doesn't have to necessarily be the accomplishment itself. It's just how you spent your time, right? right. If you die tomorrow, what, what's important is are you proud of how you spent the time you were given? Yeah, ideally you wish you would have had more maybe or whatever, but are you proud of how you spent it or are you like, I left a lot on the table, yeah, right? I mean, and you, yeah, wanna, you don't like, want that to be the case. Right. And, and like, I don't give a f how I die. I mean, I hope I die peacefully. Let me, let's just throw that shit in there real quick. I hope everybody dies right, peacefully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I just, like, if someone told me, dude, you're going to die in a week from now, I'm like, f all right, I'm spending as much as time as I can with my family. I'm going to produce as much painting as, as I can. I'm going to, like, I'm going to do as much as I can in a, in a fucking week. And then I, I'm going to just, you know, f you know, take a bottle to the dome and say, take me. I'm yeah. finished. Like, Boom, that's my final piece. Break the brushes in half and I'm throwing them across the room. Like, let's do this. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. that's how I'm going out. Well, let's let's assume that you're not going out for a long time. So <laughs> assuming that you're going to be here in the coming months, years, whatever, what can we expect? Now that everyone's going to hop on your Instagram or whatever, all my friends are going to be your friends or all my friends and everyone's going to want to see our friend Isaac succeed. Do what this are we every gonna, weekend. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, yeah, dude, right? <laughs> so what um what can we expect to see from you moving forward? What are the any upcoming stuff that's going to um, happen? Definitely, you know, just producing more work. I mean, I, I got a, I bought a bunch of several collaborations in the work right now. I, I'm, I'm some I can't really speak of, you know, I'm trying to get more murals under my belt, I want to travel more and, and do more work overseas and just do more music. I, I, I really want to release an EP this year, um, taking, you know, really taking music more serious. Um, I hit up some of my old uh, casting directors uh, just the other day. I was like, yo, do you have any like openings for any auditions or anything like anything that I might be interested in, like, like, let me, I want to really dive back into it. Like, I really, like, want to do acting, like, like, movie acting, like, serious acting. One of my favorite actors is uh, DiCaprio and, and Johnny Depp. And in com comedy, it's probably Jim Carrey. Like, I, these are my favorite actors. And, like, I look at them and I'm like, dude, this is, like, amazing that you can just become someone else. Like, how cool is that to, like, ex escape from being you for a moment of time and becoming someone else it's like playing dress up i used to love playing dress up as a kid F love that sh dude i i used to play dress up and put on a show for like my mom and like all her friends and <laughs> like i don't know it's just something about like it's like it's like it's a weird performance it's not so much a performance for anybody else but it's like also a selfish performance for yourself so you know i, I mean you know i want to get back into that um producing bigger work definitely want to go bigger this year um, better tighten up everything that I'm doing. I feel like every last year was just sort of a, a, 
a preface to what really is going to happen in the next uh, forthcoming chapters. And, and I, I just want to go ham in everything that I'm doing, you know what I mean? And, and, and do more collaborations, release more merchandise and prints. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for what I have planned this year. I think a lot of people, the fans, the collectors, the people who uh, love merch and the people that love prints and stuff like that, that they're, they're good. They, they got some good coming to them if they're interested. Dude, yeah. I'm really excited. I'm super excited because to see how far you came in the last year is like this dude is like some people may look at him and be like, oh, this guy already made whatever. But I'm like, dude, this is the tip of the iceberg. I'm so excited to see what's going to happen like i said your art in particular just like your paintings like i'm not in the market where i got money to buy a painting but if i was gonna buy a painting you are definitely one of the top artists that i would want to buy well, one you from. Buy a print, really really print, like them print print is print is pretty um you know affordable for the for the that's why i do prints you know it's funny because someone had uh, hit me up in my dm the other day and they go oh you know you have a small edition and the prints are only like a hundred bucks you could be selling these for way more i'm like you know what sometimes it's not about making money it's about providing affordable, affordable art for your fans yeah. and for your collectors. Some people can't buy that. Shit. So it's like, all right, let me make an inexpensive print that like these collectors can buy and they can feel like they're supporting me, really supporting me. Because, you know, I, I have this big thing about like people hitting me up and being like, oh, you know, I've always supported you. Like, whoa, 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 let, let, uh, pump the motherfucking brakes real quick. You never bought anything from, from me. You never purchased any of my songs you never came to any show you never bought you never put but supporting me is putting money in my pocket you never put fucking money in my pocket so don't ever say you support me say you're a fan of what i do and you encourage what i do don't ever say you support me until you put money in my pocket then you support me well i would also mention too there are other ways to support that aren't strictly financial right like such as if somebody really likes what you're doing and they consistently share to their profile the stuff to, that to you're that doing, degree there is a level a gray area. yeah it's yeah. like it, there there is a gray area where it's like it can be like it's, okay that's the exception like if you're constantly promoting me and you're right. You're if if you sit show my work to someone and that more person ends up buying something from me, I'd consider you a supporter right, because you right. made a transaction take place. Right, but but that's what it comes down to, right? Yeah. And I, but but I in general though, I completely agree with you. Yeah, just saying, yeah. like, look, if you just you say you support me because you follow things I do, while I appreciate that number with the like on every post or whatever, right, while I appreciate right, right. that, you. Can you put your money where your mouth is exactly. a little bit? Because you do it with other things. If you're buying other things right, from other right. people, why aren't you putting it there? And and the cool part with like the prints too is that's one way for me with like having merchandise like t-shirts and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's an either an, another way to be able to purchase art in a different form with a different kind of price tag. That's and why I do fact, clothing. That's what I'm saying. While, while the fact that you have your mind open to saying like, okay, I just want, yes, I want to have my fine art that I think is valued at a certain dollar amount. And that's important. But the fact that you have your mind open to saying like okay well i do want to provide how can i do it what's a creative way for me to be able to do this to pro provide this i think that's fantastic yeah. and that way people can really jump on it it's the same way even with my show where like I'm, I'm creating this little patreon for the next season which will be for this season and i'm like what value can i give people mm -hmm. where it's like five bucks and you help me out right you know right, what i mean right. like so i'm print stickers that's what i'm saying posters. well exactly and that's where i Kitten. I'm on I'm on that one for sure. Yeah. So I like to ask this in every episode. You lived a really unique life, way more so than a lot of people. Not that it's competition, but you have. And the most interesting people that to talk to, it's not about their nine to five job. It's about whatever crazy thing that they did, whether yeah. it was the weekend warrior while they like got lost in the lake, whatever the thing is. What is a unique experience, something specific, a specific one that you're super grateful for, but only happened because you choose to pursue your passion for, in this case, art and music? Um, well, I think I spoke on it too soon. I think, I think the experience was honestly getting super faded by myself and like, and, and producing that work. I think had I not done that, had I not dove down into my depression a little bit, if I had not surrendered to it a, just a tad and, and kind of let my subconscious take, take the steering wheel for a moment, I, I wouldn't have produced that work. And that work is responsible for everything that I'm, I have right now, which is, is I'm wildly grateful for, you know? So I think, I think that's, it's probably one of those moments. Cause I'm not, I'm not a, an abusive person. I'm not an addictive person to substance. Um, my substance is, 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 is achievement. It's, um, other too, you know, um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll keep it, um, PG, uh, yeah, you know, sure. but, but my vices are, are, you know, other, other things, not, not drugs. So to, to do that felt kind of crazy to me. It's like, what am I doing? You know, it's like, why, why am I sitting here drinking? I mean, I, I have people in my family, uh, 
who I'm, I'm all, again, I can't put on blast, but people who took alcohol to a very abusive level, people very, 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 very close to me, um, to just damn near too close to home. Um, and, and I thought to myself, like, why am I doing this? Like, I don't agree with this at all. Like, why am I, you know, but had, had it not been for that experience, and I don't encourage anyone to, like, do substance. I don't think you need to fucking do, like, shrooms or DMT or any type of, like, hallucinogen to be more creative. I, I think that, that people who seek that, they can't find something about themselves and then they're seeking to find it and they some people do find it that way and, and i'm not hating on it like it go by all means like people who have closed mi- closed minds need that to open their mind and i've experienced so much in my fucking life i felt like my mind is a little too open i've opened my mind to everything i've seen a lot of shit. i've seen bad things good things uh, weird things exciting things i've done adventure stuff i've done you know things that have that have put me in a state of like euphoria and, and, and adrenaline so I've done a lot of things that have that have allowed me to experience these these wide range of emotions and and, and open and expand my mind uh, I mean I don't, there's nothing that I'm not like willing to I mean try if, if I don't think that it's gonna like hurt me you know, like I think about consequences first you know, I don't just do things you know I think about okay let me see if this is is this, is this a good idea let me let me spec let me speculate this for a second but yeah I think that was one of those moments where I'm like yeah, it was pretty nuts. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, well, it comes down to personal growth, right? Right. And, like, and that opportunity, for whatever reason, it wasn't planned and it wasn't whatever, but for whatever reason, you were able to grow from that because you saw, hey, I'm capable of doing other things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's that's what it comes down to is like stop having these limiting beliefs. Even if you don't think that you have a limiting belief, you you did, yeah. right? And then through something like that, which it doesn't have to be drinking, it can be all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. People can go sit on a mountain, and that's what happens. Yeah, or for yeah, me, yeah. I get divorced, and then all of a sudden I'm looking inwards, like, what the fuck is wrong with me? Yeah. And then yeah. I learn that it's nothing wrong with me, but I'm able to do different things. It's a it. it's a pivotal moment. It's an epiphany, right. and right. that was a form of an epiphany for me. It just came in in in, in a bottle. <laughs> you know what right, I mean? Right. And um, not that that like I'm not a drinker. I just was drinking. I was having a few beers. To, I always have a few beers when I work, but the few beers was just like, I was feeling good. I was like, yeah, I'm going to drink a bottle. I'm going to take some shots. Like, I, and when I go out, I drink, of course. Like, I, I party. Sure. But like, this was, uh, I was in the comfort of my apartment. I was not partying. I was alone, you know? Right. And and I was like, why am I doing this to myself? I right. hate hangovers. And I'm about right. to, I feel a hangover coming. And, um, but, you know, yeah, I think that was one of those moments. But there have been lots of moments of, uh, you know, realizations and even, even when it didn't involve anything crazy, I mean, even doing graffiti, like, you know, I still, I still get up and, and I still go around and, and whenever I, I have a chance to, you know, put something up, I, I still do it. And that's an adrenaline rush. And, and then every time I do it, I'm like, damn, dude, I could have done it better. I'm like, even yeah. though this is crazy, but like, I'm glad I did it. I'm like, someone's going to see this. Shit. You know, so my homie, uh, Marco just texted me. Someone covered one of my pieces on Melrose. I got to go and put this back up now. Like, <laughs> like, damn, dude. Like, the yeah. fact that it's only up for a couple of weeks. Like, yeah, yeah and graffiti has such a short lifespan for some people. It No, it does. But it has a lot of inspiration for yeah. other things. So what you just talked, obviously, that didn't end up being a mistake, thankfully. No. Um, but usually people make at least one mistake. I'm sure you've made a lot of mistakes. What's a mistake that you made earlier on that you learned something from that you think someone listening could benefit from? I think, um, okay, this this might be it. So... When I moved uh, to Vegas, I moved to go be with my ex. I was leaving a lot of shit behind. I was leaving my my mom, my dad, my my siblings. Like, I needed to escape. I needed to get the f- away from everybody. I was gonna end up murdering my mom's ex husband. I mean, and I know it's probably sh- you know shouldn't dis- disclose such explicit information, but I'm gonna be honest with you. I almost fucking mur- I almost took his fucking life. Like, I hated the guy. So I needed to get the f- out. Like, I needed to get away before I became a f- felon and and I was willing to waste everything on that you know just because I was just sick and tired of it I mean it's like so much I mean just a lot of weight just finally breaking the the the, you know the thin ice that it was sitting on and I I got away and I and I thought I was you know I was was super into my ex-girlfriend I mean I I knew her since I was uh, in elementary school you know we went to third grade together she was like my elementary school sweetheart um, but I, I went, you know, I, I went away to go be with this person and, um, 
I, I put a lot of things on a on the back burner and and I just kind of like my art kind of slowed down and I was just so like involved and just this invested in just wanting to please this person and like and just ah, get her to like love me as much as I fucking loved her. Like I, it was like a different kind of obsession. It was like not obsession where it was abusive. It was like obsession to the point where like you know when you lo- it's like loving your mom almost. It's like dude, I I would die for this person. I would fucking do anything. I just want to see this person do good. Right. That's all I want. You know what I mean? It was that kind of like I what could I do to better your life? What could I do to benefit you? Not what can I get from you? What can I give you? You know right. what I mean? It was one of those things. And it, it just broke me apart. I mean, we ended up breaking up when I moved back from Vegas, we tried to do the long distance thing. Uh, we did long distance the first year. We're together for four years. Um, and the last year we tried to do the long, st- long distance thing again. And it like, f- we broke up on pretty bad terms. It f***ed me up pretty bad. And and I felt like I wasted a lot of time, but I'm also like, you know, it it, it gave me a realization because had I not gone to Vegas, I wouldn't have started painting. It was see, there goes it was more of a realization thing. Not, not not maybe not even so much a mistake because at that point, like, I don't think it was a mistake for me to fall in love. You know, it, was, it wasn't a mistake for me to try to go be with someone that I really cared for. But it was um, I, maybe I was a little blindsided to what I was doing, a little naive, uh, maybe a little you know um, premature. But I, I definitely like you know people to be careful with who you waste. My, I guess the point is be careful who you invest your time into because sometimes those people aren't invested in you, and you're better off with, without those people. Because I'll tell you when, when I when I became single, my life uh, went in, in a radical upward spiral. You know, went in all kinds of directions, but I was going upward. You know, it's kind of like like a, like a, a stock over the the twenty years. You know, it was like it was ups and downs, but you look at it from a far distance over the span of twenty years. It w- it was a big incline, and and my life has definitely inclined since then. So, um, you know, just be careful who you invest your time to, because I know some people who invest their time, um, into people and they and they lose a lot of time. Well, what it comes down to, right, is if somebody truly loves you, whether it's a friend or a family member, or a, a significant other or whatever, they will want to watch you succeed as much as possible. They yeah. want the absolute best for you. And yeah. if you're not doing what's best for you specifically because you want to make them happy and they're OK with it, there's something wrong going on there. Yeah. You, you should be able to both support each other to be the best people that you can possibly be. But that's obviously rare and difficult to find. Coming to the end of the episode, I always I, I always ask this at the end too. I didn't for the first little bit, but I think it's important because we were talking about support before. I want to ask, and I'll, I guess I'll preface with how you can support me, but it's important if you appreciate what people do to show them support in one way or another. Yeah. I always like to tell people you don't have to spend any money by any means. You don't have to join my Patreon. You certainly can. That's the best way to do it. But if you can't, on Instagram, you can follow me at Passion Pod. You can follow Isaac at Isaac Palea. Um, share even if you have literally no money sharing something when i post it to your story or to your page itself and taking me is a very very helpful thing send me a message when you listen to an episode that you enjoy that's like a super easy way to do it there's a whole lot of ways to do it the only thing is if i don't hear from you in one way or another whether it's dollar amount whether it's an order online whether it's you know sending me a dm if i literally don't hear from you i don't even know that you enjoyed it i don't know that it was worth anything anything so please reach out or do whatever that's how you can support me how can people best support you moving forward i i would agree with the same thing and let me let me um correct some things or or finish that statement because i don't want people to be like oh well i can't not everyone can afford a painting it's not about that it's it's absolutely there's definitely other ways to support without financials i'm just saying there's a lot of people who have tried to say like oh i've supported you since day one type it's like you've never done anything like you've never even come to a show you never share my work you're just trying to tell me that because you see that i'm like i'm popping now you're like don't don't be that person you know what i mean like say like oh i really love what you're doing and i'm happy for you i much appreciate that more than you saying oh i support you you know what i mean there's a fine line like i take it that way um i mean and, and you don't have to put money in my pocket you could absolutely love my work and, and i appreciate it. but like you said tell me that share my work tell my tell your friends about my work um you know put if you care that much, then then blow me up. Like like push me the way you push 
other stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, if you truly are serious about supporting me, you know what I mean? And then it's like, I know I don't be more than happy to return the favor. You know, whenever people have like products or something that they want me to try, I'm like, dude, and send it over. Like I'll, I'll, I'll try it on. I'll see what it is. I mean, I'll, I'll post and tag, like whatever, like whatever I can do to like boost up what you, what you got going on. If it's a product that I genuinely, I'm like, ah, oh, dude, I don't, don't want to buy this. You know what I mean? I'm like, I sometimes won't buy it, but I will definitely share it and try to get someone else to buy it. You know what I mean? Because then it's like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. I'm not, I'm not telling you. I'm supporting you. I'm gonna be like, all right, I'm gonna see what I can do to help you out. Like what, it, whether it's like buying, putting money in your pocket, or like driving more viewers to your. Right. Show. Well, I think what it has to come down to is like, are you taking an action that will realistically help that person? Right. Right. And there's right. a lot of ways to do that, but is the action you're talking about? Is it actually going to help them? Right, right. That and, and I think people are confused with that. And then they, when they say like, "Oh, like just because you follow me, that doesn't mean you can, you know, really like are doing shit to help me." It's like you don't share my work, you don't like my, shit, you don't comment on, shit, you don't, you don't seem involved in my. Shit. You only respond when you see good things happening. You know, if I'm like falling off or whatever, you, you don't, you're not there. Right. That that I think I think that a little bit of the bitterness comes from that. Sure. If, if if I'll see, I'll be the one to say, "Oh, I'm bitter." You know what I mean? Like if, if sure. I, I'll admit that, but it's like there's a lot of people that have just you know come out of the fucking woodwork when I'm not when when I'm suddenly doing. Shit. Right. Oh, I support. I've been support. Bro, no, you can have it. Don't 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 ever say that shit because you were never there. Right. You're ne you were never there then, and don't 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 try to be here now. And if you want to be here now, well then fucking buy something if you're that serious. Exactly. About, if you want to yeah. be here now to support me, there's a there are ways to do it and do that before you pretend yeah. that I mean, we've been best friends yeah, forever. There's right? ways to do that. <laughs> even on an inexpensive level i'm Absolutely. like i sell clothes for like t-shirts for like 20 30 bucks like and you're telling me that you're 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 you're, you're i see you spending on like fucking supreme clothes and like louis vuitton and like going here and going there and you're gonna tell me that you can't afford that well then all of that shit you're wearing must be fake <laughs> yeah. or borrowed whatever i like I, I don't post i don't make my lifestyle seem a way that's fake. Like if right. I have, if you see me and like you think something about me, you pro it's probably because it's for real. Right. You know what I mean? Like, oh, like I don't, I'm not rich. I'm not like super fucking wealthy. I mean, you know what I mean? Like it, I'm not a millionaire. Well, you're just another person. You know what I mean? Right, and you right. still have your own struggles you're dealing right. with. I'm, and honestly, when like coming in looking from Wisconsin, dude, it's so incredibly expensive out here that oh, like yeah. even if you make way more money, it's no. so hard to like look and be like, hey, I'm successful and have a house and everything. Right. I know you just bought one, but in right. general, like right. and, and success damn. isn't even measured by money. No, it's, it is. It's just how you feel about what you're whatever it is. I feel like I'm I'm pretty successful do, for for myself. I feel like I've done a lot, but do I feel like I've reached my my potential? Ah, no, dude, I'll never reach my potential. And that's I'm okay with that because that'll always keep me running and chasing who I can be in the next 10 years. Uh, I like that. Right. I, that keeps me going. So, well, and now, so now that I'm supporting you as of today, because yeah. I'm going to be posting stuff about you and whatever, but now that I'm supporting you, my friend is going to blow up to his potential when, you know, 10 years from now, you're the most famous artist in the world. And then I'll be able to text you and say, doggy, remember how I support you? <laughs> dude, no, no, we'll be definitely talking about like this yeah, 10 years from now, I mean, like, bro, do you remember? Like, I remember, dude, I was nobody then. <laughs> like, you thought I was, I thought I was nobody 10 years from the, the ago from then. No, I was really nobody then. Yeah. Well, thank, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really, really appreciate it. Look forward to this budding new friendship that I now have. <laughs> I'm going to have to come out here and kick it with you and have a casual few beers with some cool people. Thank you again for inviting me. And thanks for the homie Max, aka Visual Dirt, for connecting the dots. Um, you know, yeah, whenever you're back in town, dude, feel free to come through, you know, come over to the studio, drink some beers, go get some food, whatever the case may be. Like, you know, let's kick it for sure. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.